Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel and our objective is to take a brief look at the solenoid operated valve. A solenoid operated valve is an electromechanical valve that serves as a principal interaction point between the electrical control and the hydraulic power aspects of an electrically controlled hydraulic system. A solenoid operated valve establishes or interrupts hydraulic power but does so only at the request of a low voltage electrical control signal. An operator can use a low voltage pilot device like a push button to turn on or off a high pressure hydraulic system, thus offering a level of isolation and safety. If you want to think of it in this fashion, a solenoid operated valve is quasi equivalent to a contactor inside an electrically controlled system incorporating motors. A contactor establishes or interrupts high voltage, high current electrical power, but does so only at the request of a low voltage control signal. Similarly, a solenoid operated valve establishes or interrupts high pressure hydraulic power, but does so only at the request of a low voltage electrical control signal. A solenoid operated valve is typically characterized as a directional control valve that is electrically actuated in comparison to a manually actuated directional control valve. If you've already got a basic understanding of directional control valves, one simply swaps out a manual lever or hydraulic pilot for a solenoid and you've got the picture. The schematic symbol for a solenoid is a box with a slash through it. Sometimes you might see an oil pilot symbol in combination with a solenoid, especially for poppet style valves. Since the solenoid operated valve serves as the principal interaction point between the control and power aspects of an electrically controlled hydraulic system, one can expect the electrically energized coil to also appear in the electrical control schematics. The electrical schematic symbol for the solenoid looks similar to a resistor and the IEC has its own version of the coil. Solenoid operated valves being the principal interaction point between electrical control and hydraulic power, I must remind you that electrical switches are different than hydraulic and pneumatic valves. The same terminology is used differently when describing the at rest or deactivated state of a switch in contrast to the at rest or deactivated state of a valve. A normally closed electrical switch conducts electrical current in its deactivated state. However, when actuated, it switches to its opposite open state and does not allow current flow. A normally open electrical switch does not conduct electrical current in its deactivated state. However, when actuated, it switches to its opposite closed state and does allow current flow. Valves use the same terms, but they mean different things. A normally open valve does conduct fluid in its deactivated state. However, when actuated, it switches to its opposite state and closes and does not allow fluid flow. A normally closed valve does not conduct fluid in its deactivated state. However, when actuated, it shifts to its opposite open state and does allow fluid flow. The valves and solenoids associated with the valves are typically assigned an easily recognized identifier. This is a two position, four way, spring offset, single solenoid operated valve. I'm calling the valve DCV1, and that single solenoid, I'm calling DCV1 sole A. In its deactivated state, this particular valve routes flow via the cross connect position because of the spring offset and the cylinder retracts. When an operator presses push button one, DCV1 solenoid A is energized. The energized solenoid pushes the valve into the straight through position and pressurized flow enters the cap end and the cylinder extends. The solenoid itself is an actuator that converts electrical input into linear mechanical movement. Similar to the solenoids found in contactors and relays, a solenoid operated valve has an electrically excited coil and an armature, sometimes called a plunger. In contrast to the contactor and relay, the armature is not mechanically interlocked to a contact carrier and electrical contacts, but rather a spool or poppet via a push or pull pin. Energizing the solenoid coil pulls the armature into it, and the moving armature can either push or pull the spool or poppet into the activated state depending on how it is attached to the solenoid armature. There exist solenoid operated valves for both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Solenoid operated valves for hydraulic systems ordinarily incorporate a drain port on the back side of the solenoid to prevent any fluid that leaks around the spool from accumulating and resisting movement. 
considered these two solenoid operated valves with similar construction but totally opposite functionality. They're both two position, two way, spring offset, single solenoid operated valves. However, the one on the left in its deactivated state is dumping the accumulator to tank and only keeping the accumulator from bleeding down in its activated or opposite state. The loss of electrical power to this solenoid would dump the pressure inside the accumulator. This type of solenoid operated valve might be suitable for an application that removes the hazardous stored energy in the accumulator when the system is powered off. In contrast, this one on the right hand side in its deactivated state is keeping the accumulator from bleeding down and only dumping the accumulator to tank in its activated or opposite state. This type of solenoid operated valve might be suitable for an application that needs to make use of the stored energy in the accumulator when the system undergoes an emergency shutdown. An example might be the hydraulic system used to pitch some modern horizontal axis wind turbine blades into or out of the wind. An emergency shutdown requires the turbine spill wind and aerodynamically break the rotor. This type of solenoid operated valve allows the stored energy in the accumulator to be used for this purpose. A misreading of the schematic symbols can have life-threatening consequences. This solenoid in its deactivated state keeps the accumulator charged. Any technician assuming the system is okay to work on in its deactivated state runs the risk of being injured or killed by the stored hydraulic energy in the accumulator. It is for this reason that some solenoid operated valves incorporate a means of manually overriding the valve's deactivated state in the absence of a coil signal or in the event of a damaged coil. These manual overrides may or may not feature a detent that locks the valve in the position and may be activated by pushing or pulling the manual override depending if the solenoid is a push or pull type. Consider this two position, three port solenoid operated valve and all the creative ways it can be put to use. If we use port three as our pressure port, we have a normally closed valve. The pressure port is blocked while the actuator port 1 is drained to tank 2. If we use port 2 as our pressure port, we have a normally open valve. The pressure port 2 is connected to the actuator port 1 and the tank port 3 is blocked. If we use port 1 as our pressure port, we have a selector valve. The pressure port 1 is either connected to port 2 or port 3 depending upon valve position. Thus, it is selecting which port will get the system pressure and flow. Consider the operation and application of a three-position, four-way, spring-centered, double-solenoid, solenoid-operated valve. These valves are often used for extend and retract functions of a double-acting cylinder or as forward and reverse control of a bidirectional hydraulic motor. The deactivated center position can be used to stop the actuator in mid-stroke with a closed center or dump the pump flow to tank with a tandem center, or allow the actuator to be manually positioned with a float center, or both dump the pump flow to tank and allow the actuator to be manually positioned with an open center. I'll call this particular three position, four way spring centered, double solenoid operated valve DCV2. I'll call the associated solenoids DCV2 sole A and DCV2 sole B. When solenoid A is energized, the directional control valve shifts to the straight through position and the cylinder extends. When solenoid A is de-energized, the spring center directional control valve returns to the closed center position and the cylinder remains extended. When solenoid B is energized, the directional control valve shifts to the cross connect position and the cylinder retracts. Pause to consider what would happen if both solenoid A and solenoid B were energized for directional control valve 2 simultaneously. One would assume that the spool would be tugged in equal and opposite directions, but that isn't the case. One of the solenoids is always quicker and stronger, and the spool will be moved in the direction of the fastest and strongest solenoid. What's particularly problematic is that determining which solenoid is the fastest and strongest isn't practical. Not only does it not make sense to simultaneously extend and retract a cylinder, 
it would be impossible to predict what would happen. The cylinder would retract one day and extend the next. In addition to the pure nonsense and unpredictability of simultaneously or randomly extending or retracting a cylinder, consider the current drawn by the coil of the solenoid that lost the tug of war. Without the armature being pulled into the coil, the coil could still be experiencing the characteristic inrush for some coil operation voltages. This inrush current is excessive, but ordinarily only momentary in nature. If a coil was energized for a long period, and the armature doesn't move into the coil, either because it lost a tug of war with the other solenoid, or the spool was otherwise kinked or bound up, the coil might experience a premature death due to excessive current. It is for this reason solenoid-operated valves with two solenoids typically feature an electrical interlock between the two coils. The relays internal to hardwired ladder logic or the programmed instructions inside a PLC prevent the B coil from being energized when the A is energized, and on the flip side, prevent the A coil from being energized when the B coil is energized. When the extend button is pushed, the relay coil CRE is energized through the normally closed CRR1 contact. The contacts associated with CRE are the normally closed contact CRE1 and the normally open contact CRE2. When the relay coil CRE is energized, the associated contacts change state. The normally closed CRE1 contact opens, and the normally open CRE2 contact closes. The now closed CRE2 contact energizes DCV2 sol A. The valve shifts to the straight through position and the cylinder extends. If an operator holds down the extend button, and simultaneously presses the retract button, the now open CR1E contact in series with the retract push button and the CRR relay prevents DCV2 solenoid B from energizing. On the flip side, when only the retract button is pushed, the relay coil CRR is energized through the normally closed CRE1 contact. The contacts associated with the CRR relay are the normally closed CRR1 contact and the normally open CRR2 contact. When energized, the contacts associated with this relay change their opposite state. CRR1 opens and CRR2 closes. Through the now closed CRR2 contact, DCV2 solenoid B energizes. The energized DCV2 solenoid B shifts the valve to its cross-connect position and the cylinder retracts. If an operator was to simultaneously press the extend button, the CRE coil would not be energized because of the now open CRR1 contact in series. The electrical interlocks provided by this ladder logic prevent one coil from being energized while the other is energized. We'll return to discuss electrical interlocks, limit switches, and holding contacts in later lectures that add increased functionality to this electrically controlled hydraulic system. For now, you should be reasonably savvy enough to understand that simultaneously extending and retracting a cylinder makes as much sense as simultaneously spinning a motor clockwise and counterclockwise. Electrical interlocks prevent this dangerous nonsense from happening. Here is a solenoid-operated pneumatic valve. You'll notice two important characteristics on the nameplate. One, this is a two-position, five-port, double solenoid-operated valve with a detent. Two, notice the manufacturer's whimsical misspelling of the term pneumatics. Very cute. This valve's cuteness has been noted. One might be taken aback by two solenoids for a two-position valve. Ordinarily, one sees a two-position valve controlled by a single solenoid and a spring offset to one of the positions when the solenoid is de-energized not this valve. This particular valve makes use of the solenoid to push the valve into one position, and then the detent holds it in this place until the next time the opposite solenoid is energized, pushing the spool out of place. The detent then keeps the valve in this position, and the process can repeat itself as needed. This particular valve can be thought of as a solenoid-operated valve that isn't electrically held, but rather mechanically held. The solenoid moves it into the new position, 
and then the detent takes it from there. The loss of electrical power does not see the valve move to its deactivated state. Safety considerations must be taken into account when using detented valves. Applications for a detented solenoid-operated valve include clamping a lifted object. If electrical power is lost, the detented valve ensures that the object remains clamped and doesn't drop to the floor and shatter into a million sharp pieces. When pushed into this position, by this solenoid, pressurized airflow is routed to A, and B is routed to the B exhaust. The detent keeps it here until such time that the solenoid pushes it into this position, where pressurized airflow is routed to B, and A is routed to the A exhaust. The solenoids feature a recessed means of manually actuating each pushpin on either side. When manually actuated, one can feel the valve shift position. The base plate features stamped port markings obscured by generations of accumulated sawdust. The electrical connections to the two coils poke out the back. If these wires weren't labeled, you could pop the top off the valve to see which connection goes to which coil. Notice A is stamped on the right, and B is stamped on the left. We can pop off the solenoid covers. Notice the gasket and the protruding portion of the spool. When we remove the solenoid from the cover, we see the coil and the extended armature. When energized, the armature is pulled into the coil and this armature directly pushes the protruding portion of the spool. We can remove the spool from the valve. Notice the lands and valleys that selectively open or block port connections inside the valve when moved to a new position. Notice the detent used to keep the spool in the preferred position until actuated by the opposite solenoid. Once we remove the other solenoid, we can take a quick peek down the barrel of the valve body. The perforations are the incoming and outgoing air ports selectively opened and closed by the lands and valleys of the solenoid shifted spool. Now that we've got a general understanding of a solenoid operated valve, Let's now discuss some general specifications of coils and solenoid operated valves and highlight some points of interest before we close up shop. A disclaimer before we continue. Always consult the manufacturer's datasheet for a specific solenoid operated valve of interest. Do not for a moment assume all solenoid operated valves operate in this manner. The specifications presented herein are universal in nature. A thick, tangled jungle of manufacturer differences exist especially for older solenoid operated valves. First, let's talk about the coil of the solenoid operated valve. Similar terminology was employed for both the contactors and control relays lectures when discussing the coil, so this might be a review if you've already watched these lectures. First, the coil rated voltage must be matched to that of the control circuit voltage. A programmable logic controller with a 24 volt DC output cannot operate the coil of a solenoid operated valve intended to operate on 120 volts AC. Either one must use a programmable logic controller capable of supplying 120 volts AC output to directly operate the coil or find a means of translating these two different voltage levels and flavors. Typically such interaction occurs inside an interposing relay, basically a device that translates one magnitude of input to a different level of output. We'll discuss both programmable logic controllers and interposing relays in later lectures. In addition to rated voltage, coils have a pickup, hold in, and drop out voltage. Pickup voltage is the minimum amount of voltage necessary to overcome the at rest resistance of the armature and spool or poppet. The hold in voltage is the minimum voltage necessary for the coil to maintain the armature in the activated position once it has been activated. As can be expected, the hold-in voltage to maintain a position is a little less than the pickup voltage necessary to initiate movement to a new position. Finally, the dropout voltage is the amount of voltage below which the coil just returns the valve to the deactivated state. Coils with both the same AC and DC voltage ratings are not normally interchangeable. Those with an understanding of reactance realize a coil of wire presents both a resistive and inductive impedance to AC voltage whereas DC voltage sees only the resistive portion. Current draw for the same coil operated at AC versus DC voltages, even of the same magnitude, will be astoundingly different. Additionally, an AC coil experiences an inrush current upon being energized in comparison to that of its sealed-in or stable value. The armature must be completely pulled into the coil to reach the sealed-in state. A kinked spool resisting movement 
might damage the coil due to excessive current draw. In addition to these specifications, the coil manufacturer might also indicate a duty cycle under which the coil will operate as expected, over which excessive heat and damage may result. Let's move on to discuss the solenoid-operated valve and its interaction with the coil. If your application calls for shifting a valve under full flow and pressure conditions, it is important to review the shift limit characteristics for the chosen flow paths to ensure the coil has enough force to shift the spool. It is for this reason that manufacturers ordinarily offer various spools and coils to maximize the flow and pressure capacities for the desired flow function. The solenoid-operated valve, like other hydraulic valves, typically have a rated flow and a maximum inlet pressure. The rated flow is a quick snapshot of this valve's performance at that flow rate. If you wanted to dive deeper into the valve's performance at flow rates other than the rated flow, you'd ordinarily consult the pressure drop for different flow rates performance curve or the operating limits performance curve. The pressure drop for different flow rates performance curve shows the typical restriction pressure drop created by the valve at different flow rates. Ordinarily, the pressure drop across the valve should be between the two curves. If you're observing different values, the valve is obstructed, silted over, or otherwise damaged. The operating limits performance curve tells you the maximum inlet pressure actually varies as flow rate changes. The snapshot presented by the rated flow and maximum inlet pressure is a point on this curve. Additionally, valve specifications typically describe the amount of leakage at a certain viscosity and pressure conditions with the understanding that fluid with lower viscosity, i.e. thinner fluid, will leak more, as will higher pressure applications. Valve specifications typically state the fluid compatibility, viscosity, and level of filtration required for proper operation. The valve seals must be assessed for compatibility with the temperature and fluid being used in your application. Most manufacturers offer a choice of nitrile, fluorocarbon, or special purpose seals. Finally, physical, connection, and cavity dimensions of the valve are often included in manufacturer's data sheets. Before we bring this lecture to a close, let us discuss special purpose solenoid operated valves with notable differences between the ones I used as examples. The solenoid operated valves we examined earlier were discrete in nature and that there was a clear transition from full on to full off position or vice versa. There also exist variable solenoid valves that not only initiate movement in one direction or another, but also control flow by varying the orifice size through the valve in proportion to supplied control current. A proportional valve uses a coil supplied with not the digital presence or absence of full voltage, but rather a smoothly variable analog electrical control signal that varies position of the spool in proportion of the control signal. No signal means no movement of the spool. Full signal means full movement of the spool. Half signal means half movement of the spool. The infinitely variable signal allows the valve to be placed in an infinite number of intermediate positions. The restriction presented by the partially positioned spool acts almost like a flow control valve and directly affects the actuation speed of the actuator. Feedback transducers based off flow sensors or actuator position can be used to accurately control the desired quantity. A servo valve is something very similar to a proportional valve. However, it uses something called a force motor to indirectly position the spool. Servo valves normally have a more linear force and current relationship than a regular proportional valve and can be used for high performance closed loop control of actuator speed or position applications. We'll discuss variable solenoid operated valves like proportional and servo valves in later lectures. Finally, Consider something called a piggyback valve. A piggyback valve is a solenoid actuated pilot operated directional control valve. Although solenoid operated valves are quick acting, they have limited strength. A piggyback valve is a combination of a small solenoid operated valve used to control the main pilot operated valve. When the main valve needs to be shifted, the small solenoid operated valve shifts pilot pressure to the main valve's pilot operated spool. This allows the main valve to operate at increased system pressure and flow rate. An application for a piggyback valve is one in which the characteristics of an electrically controlled hydraulic system are desired, but excess system pressure and flow rate preclude the use of direct acting solenoid operated valves. 
This wraps up our brief introduction to the solenoid operated valve. We'll be making use of this device in later lectures as the principal interaction point between the electrical control and hydraulic power aspects of an electrically controlled hydraulic system. In conclusion, this lecture took a brief look at the solenoid operated valve. We identified the purpose and function of the solenoid, the coil, and the valve on both electrical and hydraulic schematics, and disassembled and examined a representative example. Additionally, we discussed coil and valve specifications and construction, and contrasted general purpose solenoid operated valves with detented solenoid operated valves, the piggyback valve, and variable solenoid operated valves like the proportional and servo valve. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.